The Bachem Bar 349 Natter English, colubrid, grass snake, was a World War II German point-defense rocket-powered interceptor, which was to be used in a very similar way to a manned surface-to-air missile. After a vertical takeoff, which eliminated the need for airfields, most of the flight to the Allied bombers was to be controlled by an autopilot. The primary role of the relatively untrained pilot was to aim the aircraft at its target bomber and fire its armament of rockets. The pilot and the fuselage containing the rocket motor would then land using separate parachutes, while the nose section was disposable. The only manned vertical takeoff flight on 1 March 1945 ended in the death of the test pilot, Lothar Sieber. <laughs> development In 1943 Luftwaffe air superiority was being challenged by the Allies over the Reich and radical innovations were required to overcome the crisis. Surface-to-air missiles appeared to be a promising approach to counter the Allied strategic bombing offensive. A variety of projects were started, but invariably problems with the guidance and homing systems prevented any of these from attaining operational status. Providing the missile with a pilot, who could operate a weapon during the brief terminal approach phase, offered a solution. Submissions for a simple target defense interceptor were requested by the Luftwaffe in early 1944 under the umbrella of the German, Jagernot program, literally, fighter emergency program. A number of simple designs were proposed, including the Heinkel P.1077 Julia, in which the pilot lay prone on his stomach, to reduce the frontal area. The Julia was the front runner for the contract. The initial plan was to launch the aircraft vertically, but this concept was later changed to a conventional horizontal takeoff from a tricycle wheeled trolley, similar to that used by the first eight prototypes of the Arado R-234 jet reconnaissance bomber. <laughs> Batcham's proposal Eric Batcham's BP-20 was a development from a design he had worked on at Fiesela, the Phi 166 concept, but considerably more radical than the other submissions. It was built using glued and nailed wooden parts with an armor-plated bulkhead and bulletproof glass windshield at the front of the cockpit. The initial plan was to power the machine with a Walter HWK 109-509A2 rocket motor, however, only the 109-509A1, as used in the Mi-163, was available. It had a sea level thrust variable between 100 kg (220 pounds) at idle to 1600 kg (3500 pounds) at full power with the Natter's intended quartet of rear flank mount Schmidting SG34 solid fuel rocket boosters used in its vertical launch to provide an additional 4800 kg (10600 pounds) thrust for 10 seconds before they burned out and were jettisoned. The experimental prototype slid up a 20 meters (66 feet) tall vertical steel launch tower for a maximum sliding length of 17 meters (56 feet) in three guideways, one for each wing tip and one for the lower tip of the ventral tail fin. By the time the aircraft left the tower, it was hoped that it would have achieved sufficient speed to allow its aerodynamic surfaces to provide stable flight under operational conditions. Once the Natter had left the launcher, it would be guided to the proximity of the Allied bombers by an autopilot with the possibility of an added beam guidance similar to that used in some V 2 rocket launches. Only then would the pilot take control, aim and fire the armament, which was originally proposed to be a salvo of 1955 mm caliber R 4M rockets. Later, 28 R4 megaseconds or a number of the larger, 73 mm caliber Henschel H's 297 Fon rockets were suggested, with either variety of unguided rocket fired from the Natter's nose mount cellular launch tubes contained in its nose. The Natter was intended to fly up and over the bombers, by which time its Walter motor would probably be out of propellant. Following its one-time attack with its rockets, the pilot would dive his natter, now effectively a glider, to an altitude of around 3,000 meters (9,800 feet), flatten out, release the nose of the aircraft and a small braking parachute from the rear fuselage. The fuselage would decelerate, and the pilot would be ejected forwards by his own inertia and land by means of a personal parachute. In an early proposal in August 1944, the Natter design had a concrete nose. It was suggested that the machine might ram a bomber, but this proposal was subsequently withdrawn in later Project Natter outlines. Batcham stated clearly in the initial proposal that the Natter was not a suicide weapon, and much effort went into designing safety features for the pilot. However, owing to the potential dangers for the pilot inherent in the operation of this precarious aircraft, the Natter is sometimes listed as a suicide craft. 
The design had one decisive advantage over its competitors, it eliminated the necessity to land an unpowered gliding machine at an airbase, which, as the history of the Mi-163 rocket aircraft had clearly demonstrated, made an aircraft extremely vulnerable to attack by Allied fighters. <laughs> Modifications Heinrich Himmler became interested in Batchum's design. The Reichsführer SS granted Batchum an interview and fully supported the project. In the middle of September 1944 the technical office of the Waffen-SS made an order for Batchum to develop and manufacture the Natter at his Waldsee factory. In December 1944 the project came largely under the control of the SS and Hans Kammler. This decision is said to have been the only time the SS significantly interfered with aircraft design and air fighting strategy. Early on in the project, the Reichsluftfahrtministerium RLM undertook an engineering assessment of the Natter, which it reported on the 28th of October 1944. The Natter was designed to be built by unskilled labor with poor quality tools and inexpensive material. Various stringent economies were imposed on an already frugal design. The Natter had no landing gear, which saved weight, expense, and construction time. Consequently, one of the most unusual features of the machine was the escape of the pilot and recovery of the machine. The proposed sequence of these events was as follows, after the attack, the Natter might dive to a lower altitude and flatten out into level flight. The pilot would then proceed with a well-practiced escape sequence. He would open the cockpit canopy latch, the canopy flicking backwards on its hinge in the airstream, he would undo his seat belt and remove his feet from the rudder pedal stirrups. By squeezing a lever mounted on the control column, he would release a lock at the base of the column, which would allow him to tilt the column forwards where it could engage in and undo a safety latch for the nose release mechanism. He would then lean a little further forward and pull a lever hinge near the floor at the front of the cockpit. This action frees the nose section, which self-jettisoned as a result of the reduced aerodynamic pressure at the front of the fuselage. As the nose section separates, it was intended to briefly pull on two cables that release a small ribbon parachute stored on the starboard side of the rear fuselage. The parachute subsequently opens and decelerates the natter. The pilot would be ejected from the cockpit by his own inertia and as soon as he was clear of the fuselage, he would open his personal parachute and descend to the ground. A parachute was to eject the valuable Walter rocket motor from the rear, which would decelerate the aircraft and eject the pilot with inertia, but associated problems were still not fully resolved prior to the war's end. Professor Wilhelm Fuchs reportedly calculated the Natter's aerodynamics at the Technische Hochschule, Aachen using a large analog computer. Wind tunnel testing on a wooden model, scaled to 40% of full size, was performed at the Deutsche Versuchsanstort für Luftfahrt DVL, the Institute for Aerodynamics at berlin Adlershof in September 1944 at speeds up to 504 km per hour. Results from these tests were reported in January 1945 to the Batchum work. Further model tests were carried out at the Luftfahrtforschungsanstort Hermann Göring LFA facility in Volkenrod Braunschweig, at speeds close to Mach 1. In March the Batchum work simply received a statement that satisfactory flying quality should be expected with speeds up to 1,100 km per hour. Testing Construction of the first experimental prototype Natter, Versuchsmuster 1, was completed on 4 October 1944. V1 was subsequently referred to as Baumister 1 BM1 and later still the B was dropped and the machine became known as the M1. Most subsequent prototypes were known by M codes, as the later prototypes of the Heinkel He 162 were. Manned glider flights began on 3 November 1944. The first glider M1 was towed to around 3,000 meters by a Heinkel He 111 bomber with a cable tragschlepp mode at Neuburg and der Donau. The pilot was Eric Klockner, who made all four documented German, Tragschlepp, literally towed under another plane flights. After carrying out the test program of the M1, he bailed out and the machine crashed into the ground. It was found that, unfortunately, the towing cable, and in the case of the M3, the undercarriage interfered with the flight characteristics of the gliders and consequently the results were difficult to interpret. To clear any lingering doubts about the Natter in the glider mode, Hans Zubert made a daring free flight in the M8 on 14 February, and showed that the Natter was indeed a very good flying machine. The vertical takeoff trials were conducted on high ground called the Ochsenkopf at the Truppenabungsplatz military training area Heuberg near Stetten am Kaltenmarkt, Württemberg. 
The first successful unmanned vertical takeoff from the experimental launch tower occurred on the 22nd of December 1944. The test machine, the M16, was powered only by the Schmitting solid boosters, as were all the early vertical launch trials. Up to and including the 1st of March 1945, 16 prototypes had been used, 8 in glider trials and 8 in VTO trials. Topic: <laughs> Man test flight By January 1945 Batchum was under pressure from the authorities in Berlin to carry out a man flight by the end of February. On 25 February, M22 was in the experimental launch tower. It was as complete an operational machine as possible with the Walter HWK 109-509A1 motor installed for the first time. A dummy pilot was in the cockpit. Liftoff from the tower was perfect. The engineers and ground crew watched as the M22 ascended under the combined power of the four Schmitting boosters and the Walter motor, an estimated total thrust of 6,500 kg 14,300 pounds. The nose separated as programmed and the dummy pilot descended, safely, under its personal parachute. The remainder of the fuselage came down under its two large salvage parachutes, but when it hit the ground the Walter liquid propellant rocket motor's residual hypergolic propellants T-stoff oxidizer and C-stoff fuel exploded and the machine was destroyed. Despite Batchum's concerns that the test program had been significantly cut short, a young volunteer Luftwaffe test pilot, Lothar Sieber, climbed into the cockpit of the fully fueled M23 on 1 March. The aircraft was equipped with an FM transmitter for the purpose of transmitting flight data from various monitoring sensors in the machine. A hard wire intercom appears to have been provided between Seba and the engineers in the launch bunker using a system similar to that used in the manned glider flights. Around 1100 am, the M23 was ready for takeoff. Low stratus clouds lay over the Oxenkopf. The Walter liquid fueled rocket motor built up to full thrust, and Seba pushed the button to ignite the four solid boosters. With a roar, the M23 rose out of a cloud of steam and rocket smoke straight up, displaying its camouflage paintwork. At an altitude of about 100 to 150 meters (330 to 490 feet), the Natter suddenly pitched up into an inverted curve. Initially, it climbed at about 30 degrees to the vertical. At about 500 meters (1,600 feet), the cockpit canopy was seen to fly off. The Natter continued to climb at high speed at an angle of 15 degrees from the horizontal and disappeared into the clouds. The Walter motor stalled about 15 seconds after takeoff. It is estimated the Natter reached 1,500 meters 4,900 feet, at which point it nose-dived and hit the ground with great force about 32 seconds later, some kilometers from the launch site. Unknown at the time, one of the Schmitting boosters failed to jettison and its remains were dug up at the crash site in 1998. The pilot was likely unconscious long before the crash. Batchum surmised Seba had involuntarily pulled back on the control column under the effect of the 3G acceleration. Examination of the canopy, which fell near the launch site, showed the tip of the latch was bent, suggesting it may not have been in the fully closed position at launch. The pilot's headrest had been attached to the underside of the canopy and as the canopy flew off the pilot's head would have snapped back suddenly about 25 cm hitting the solid wooden rear upper cockpit bulkhead, and either knocking Seba unconscious or breaking his neck. The accident reinforced Batchum's long-held belief that the takeoff and flight in the vicinity of the target bombers should be fully automated. The canopy latch was strengthened and the headrest was attached to the backboard of the cockpit. Before the introduction of the autopilot in the test program, the control column would have a temporary locking device on it, which would allow the machine to ascend vertically to at least 1,000 meters 3, feet and then be removed by the pilot. The Walter motor probably ceased operation because the natter was virtually upside down and air may have entered the intake pipes in the propellant tanks, starving the motor. Seba had become the first man to take off vertically from the ground under pure rocket power, some 16 years before Yuri Gagarin's Vostok 1 pioneering, peacetime orbital flight. Topic. Production None of the 150 natters the SS ordered, and the Luftwaffe's 50, was delivered by the end of the war. Much debate has surrounded the number of natters built at the Batchum work and their disposition. According to Batchum, 36 natters were produced at the Batchum work in Waldsee by the end of the war. 
Up to April 1945, 17 aircraft had been used in unmanned trials comprising five gliders, all slung under an He-111 in the Mistelschlepp configuration prior to launch, and 12 VTO examples. Five aircraft were prepared for manned trials, four gliders and one VTO version. The M3 was flown twice, and then rebuilt at which time it was given the new code BM3A but was never flown. The total number of launches to early April 1945 was 22, as was the total number of natters constructed up to that time. Batcham reported further that there were 14 more finished or almost finished aircraft in April 1945. Four of these were prototype A1 operational natters built for test launching from a wooden pole launcher, which had been designed for field deployment. This new launcher was also constructed on the Hoiberg, not far from the experimental steel tower. There is documentary evidence for two pole launches in April but not three as claimed by Batcham in his post-war presentation. The documentation for this third flight may have been destroyed by the SS at war's end. Ten A-1 operational natters, called K-Machinen, were constructed for the Crocus Einsatz. Operation Crocus. The fate of these 14 A-1 natters was as follows. Three were fired from the vertical launch tower according to Batcham, four were burnt at Waldsee, two were burnt at Lager Schlatt, Ostall, Austria, four were captured by U.S. troops at St. Leonard in Pitzdall, Austria and one, which had been sent as a sample model to a new factory in Thuringia, was captured by the Red Army. Consequently, the total of 36 test and operational aircraft constructed at the Batcham work can be accounted for. However, natacarcasses were used for a variety of ground-based purposes, for example, as a static booster rocket, armament and strength testing and pilot seat position tests. Some fuselages were reused after flight testing, for example, the M5, 6 and 7, of the four natters captured at St. Leonard in Pitzdall, two went to the United States. Only one original natter built in Germany in the Second World War survives in storage at the Paul E. Garber Preservation, Restoration, and Storage Facility in Suitland, Maryland, under the auspices of the Smithsonian Institution. The fate of the other natter brought to the U.S. is unknown. There is no documentary evidence that a natter was ever flown from Muroc Field. The tail section of one of the natters at St. Leonard in Pitstall was broken off while it still rested on its trailer. The remaining machine was possibly destroyed when the CIOS field team left the area. Despite being promised one of these natters, there is no evidence that a machine ever reached UK shores. <laughs> <laughs> Stability In early February 1945 the positions of the center of gravity for the A-1 operational machine during its flight profile were giving the RLM and the SS cause for concern. They wanted these figures to be decided upon for the upcoming construction of the A-1 aircraft for Crocus Einsatz Operation Crocus, the field deployment of the NATA. The position of the center of gravity is expressed as a percentage of the cord distance between the leading and trailing edges of the main wing. Thus 0% is the leading edge and 100% is the trailing edge. In the manned glider trials the center of gravity had been varied between 20 and 34%. At a meeting of engineers held on 8 February, the variations in the center of gravity expected in the A1 Crocus machine were discussed. At takeoff with the weight of the four solid boosters, the center of gravity would be brought back to 65%, but after releasing these rockets it would move forwards to 22%. The free flight by Zubat on 14 February had showed unequivocally that the little Natter had excellent flying characteristics as a glider. The center of gravity problem was solved initially by the addition of 1 meter square auxiliary tailfinds that were released simultaneously with the jettisoning of the boosters. The Crocus aircraft had vanes that would direct the Walter rocket exhaust gases so as to assist vehicle stabilization at low speeds similar to those used in the V-2 rocket. Topic. Legacy French forces had captured Waldsey by 25 April 1945 and presumably took control of the Batcham work. Shortly before the French troops arrived, a group of Batcham work personnel set out for Austria with five A1 Natters on trailers. At Bad Warishofen, the group waited for another squad retreating from Nabon unter Tech with one completed Natter. Both groups then set out for the Austrian Alps. One group with two natters ended up at the junction of the River Inn and one of its tributaries, the Oatstaler Ake, at Camp Schlatt. The other group went to St. Leonard im Pitzdall with four aircraft. 
U.S. troops captured the first group at Camp Schlatt around 4 May and the second group on the following day. At some time during the project, the Batcham work was ordered to give complete details of the BP 20 Nata to the Japanese, but there was doubt over whether they had received them. They were, however, known to have a general knowledge of the Nata and showed considerable interest in the project. Topic. Operation Crocus launch pads at Hazenholtz Wood An operational launch site for the first Bar 349A1 operational Natas under the code name Operation Crocus was being established in a small wooded area called Hazenholtz, south of the Stuttgart to Munich Autobahn and to the east of Nabin under Tech. Around the end of February and the beginning of March the TODT organization was in action, constructing each set of the trios of concrete foundations or footings for the launch towers. These three launch pads and their towers were arranged at the corners of an equilateral triangle, 120 meters per side. The specific locations are said to be 48 degrees 37 minutes 42.017 seconds north 9 degrees 29 minutes 53.607 seconds east, 48 degrees 37 minutes 42.043 seconds north 9 degrees 29 minutes 57.860 seconds east and 48 degrees 37 minutes 38.629 seconds north 9 degrees 29 minutes 55.140 seconds east. In the center of each of the three concrete footings is a square hole approximately 50 cm deep, which once served as the foundation for the launch tower. Beside each hole is a pipe, cut off at ground level, which was probably once a cable pit. These three concrete pads were noticed by a surveyor in the autumn of 1945, but not rediscovered until 1999. In March 1945 eight pilots, who were experienced, mostly highly decorated and volunteers for the first operational flights, started training at the Lager Heuberg. This training continued until the first half of April at which time they moved to the Hazenholtz operational area. The first three manned and fully armed A-1 Crocus examples were scheduled to be launched from 20 April, which was Hitler's birthday. But on that day the U.S. 10th Armored Division drove its tanks into Kirkheim unter Tech to the northwest of Hazenholtz Wood. The next day it crossed the Autobahn and headed straight for the Natter operational area. The Natter group subsequently retreated to Waldsee. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Surviving aircraft and replicas. Only one original A1 Natter survives. It is stored in the Paul E. Garber Preservation, Restoration and Storage Facility in Suitland, Maryland, USA. It is in a poor state of repair and is no longer accessible to the general public. The evidence supports the proposition that this machine was captured by U.S. troops at St. Leonard in Pitzdorf, Austria in May 1945. The Natter displayed at the Deutsches Museum is said to have been reconstructed partly from sub-assemblies that survived the end of the war. This machine is of the experimental type as launched from the steel tower and is painted to look like an M-17. There are several static reproductions of Natas around the world, for example at the Plains of Fame Air Museum, Chino, California and Fantasy of Flight, Polk City, Florida, U.S. <laughs> <laughs> Specifications Bar 349B1. Data from general characteristics Crew, 1 Length, 6 meters 19 feet 8 in Wingspan 4 meters 13 feet 1 in Height 2.25 meters 7 feet 5 in without fins Wing area 4.7 square meters 51 square feet Empty weight 880 kilograms 1940 pounds fuel expended Gross weight 2232 kilograms 4921 pounds Gross weight boosters jettisoned, 1,769 kg 3,900 lb Fuel capacity, 650 kg Powerplant, 1 times Walter HWK 109-509 C1 by fuel rocket motor, 11.2 kN 2,500 lbf Thrust Hauptofen main chamber 2.9 kN 652 lbf Marshofen auxiliary chamber powerplant, 4 times Schmidting SG-34 solid fuel booster rockets, 4.9 kN 1,100 lbf Thrust each or 2 by 9.8 kN 2,203 lbf Solid fuel booster rockets performance 
maximum speed 1000 km per 621 miles per hour 540 knots at 5000 meters 16404 feet Cruise speed 800 km per hour 497 miles per hour 432 knots Range 60 km 37 miles 32 nmi after climb at 3000 m 9843 feet 55 km 34 miles after climb at 6000 m 19685 feet 42 kilometers 26 miles after climb at 9000 meters 29528 feet 40 kilometers 25 miles after climb at 10000 meters 32808 feet endurance 4.36 minutes at 6000 meters 19685 feet 3.15 minutes at 9000 meters 29528 feet service ceiling 12000 meters 39000 feet Rate of climb: 190 meters per second, 37,000 feet per minute. Time to altitude: 62 seconds to 12 kilometers, 7.5 miles. Armament: 24 times 73 millimeters, 2.874 in. Henschel H's 297 Fon rocket shells, or 33 times 55 millimeters, 2.165 in. R4M rocket shells, or 2 times 30 millimeters, 1. 181 in MK 108 cannon with 30 RPG proposed. Topic. See also. Wasserfall related development. Zero length launch aircraft of comparable role, configuration, and era. Mi 163. Mizuno Shinyu. Skoda Kauba SKP. 14. Related lists List of aircraft of World War II List of World War II military aircraft of Germany